Welcome to the flipped lesson on an introduction to rhetoric for our AP language and composition course. This is a pretty lengthy uh, slideshow and presentation, so I'll encourage you to pause from time to time to look at the breadth of information on each slide. I'm not going to read word for word from each slide. I'm going to hit the high points, but if you're interested in taking notes or need to kind of review some stuff or read the things that I don't say, I encourage you to utilize your pause button um, so that you can make sure that you kind of fully absorb everything that we're going to talk about. And on your screen are the different topics to be covered. This lesson is very important because this is what founds our entire course. So I want you to have this at your disposal to come back to throughout the entire course um, as we move from unit to unit and as we prepare for the AP test. To do well in this course, you have to understand everything that I'm about to go through. And this is the building block to really found the course so that we can do more complex stuff. So to begin, the first thing I want to talk about is actually defining what rhetoric is because it's a term that you're going to hear throughout this entire course all the way through. Um, it's a type of discourse, discourse, some kind of art to improve the way that we speak and the way that we write. So it's kind of a toolbox of sorts. And any kind of um, purpose that you have when speaking or writing, whether you're just strictly informing, persuading, or motivating, and the majority of the things we'll look at in this course are arguments and persuasion. And there's different variations that one can take um, with the art of discourse, with rhetoric, um, speaking and writing effectively, um, looking at the effective speech, you know, necessary skills for job interviews or you know, for public speaking, and, you know, and me as a teacher, to, to be able to speak effectively in front of the class, I have to know um, the tools and the words and the different strategies that will work best to appeal to you, to get you to learn and to get you motivated. So those are the kinds of things that rhetoric is um, in its most simplistic form. Rhetoric has been around for a long time, um, about 2,500 years ago with Aristotle and him publishing what's referred to as On Rhetoric his guide to being a successful speaker and writer. And what Aristotle founded 2,500 years ago is still utilized today, so he really knew what he was talking about. And he has ideas of three things that this lecture will look at, ethos, pathos, and logos, um, appeals to one's character, to emotion, and to logic. And those are the most successful pillars in order to build a successful argument or to achieve a certain goal when speaking or in writing. So to get started, the first thing I want to define is what ethos is. Um, the key points I've underlined or I have italicized throughout the rest of this presentation. The ethos is a strategy to assess somebody's character or credibility. Um, without credibility, there is no merit. So if, if someone doesn't trust you, they're not going to listen to what you have to say. Or if you're not a credible source when you're writing something, what you're trying to say or you're trying to prove is not going to be accepted very well. So there are many questions to consider when looking at somebody's cred credibility. Um, their trustworthiness, their authority, their expertise here, you know, sim simplistically, someone's respect for you. Are you a respected individual? Do you have good character? Do you know what you're talking about? If you're not very knowledgeable, what you have to say is not going to be um, absorbed or comprehended at all f from your audience. Um, the credibility is also thanks to the similarities shared between the audience and the speaker or the writer. So things to consider is one's age. Um, if someone's trying to talk to a, a group of high schoolers about college, it may be someone that's just now in college, closer to their age, um, that will be more receptive versus someone who's in their 80s and maybe never went to college or went to college many, many years ago when times were a little bit different. Um, race and culture, if someone's coming to talk about um, the, their Mexican heritage and the classroom um, is, is full of all Caucasian students, there's a barrier that's there. Or if I'm going to speak about Mexican culture and I am a, a Caucasian, I don't really know what I'm talking about or don't know it fully because I'm not really a part of that group. You look at other things such as socioeconomic status, citizenship, career, education, and generally just one's personality. So I want you to kind of look at these examples up here and spend a second and pause your video to see what kind of similarities you have with each of these situations um, on your screen. Something that's a little bit different that has been added since Aristotle's time are the notions of authority and expertise. Back in our um, 
Aristotle's time, there wasn't the social ladder like there is today. There wasn't, you know, advanced college degrees and doctoral programs to where people could become experts or the chain of command and hierarchy where you report to work and you have a boss or there's that flow chart and flow system. So authority refers to the relationship between the speaker and the audience. So there's several things that can um, be included in that. Organizational authority, if you have a job and you have a supervisor, they have more credibility than you, which gives them that position. Political authority, um, you can run for president, but if you have been through school and served your time in Congress and Senate and other kind of governmental places here, you have more political authority than someone that's just turned 35 and is now able to run for president. Religious authority, um, someone that's well not well versed in religion, a priest, pastor, or nun, has that different kind of authority than the common man. Educational authority, I have more authority than you in the school. Um, I'm the department chair, so I have a little more authority than the English department. But then Miss Williams, our principal, has more authority than I do, and so does the superintendent have more authority than she does. And then age, you always hear respect your elders. People that are, uh, have been through a lot that are older and more knowledgeable and wise um, has more authority and ethos um, than the general person. But in hindsight here, the, the greater one's authority, the higher their likelihood the audience is going to pay attention and be persuaded by what he or she has to say. So then your reputation or your expertise um, is the fourth and final component of ethos. Um, expertise is what you know about the topic, and the reputation is what the audience knows about the topic. So you have to look at several things. One is experience in the field. If I'm going to go and give a lecture on education, and I only have taught one year, um, what, is, what kind of good is that going to do for me if there's someone else that's there and has served 30 years? And if you have not really spent a lot of time in the field and you're listening to my lecture, your reputation and what you know about it um, it's about as low as my expertise was just one year under my belt. Um, proximity to the topic. If I'm going to speak about um, the damage that hurricanes can do, but I live in the mountains and I've never really been through a hurricane, I've never really been close to that topic, been affected by it, um, and I'm not a very knowledgeable source. Production in the field. Are you published, authored, or created anything that's related? Um, that's a big one here. Achievements and recognitions, how have you been accoladed for what you've done? That can really boost your reputation. And then demonstrated skill, you know, if you're discussing money management, are you in debt? That really works against you. Um, or are you able to really be a financial advisor? These are the, the kind of complicated things you have to look at when assessing someone's credibility. And throughout the course, we're not going to refer to it as, as ethos. I want you to refer to it as someone's character or their credibility. Don't just define it as ethos. So when you look at all this, you just can't check and say, yes, someone has ethos, or no, they don't. Um, it's more um, personalized and subjected. So different qualities can work in your favor. Every situation is a little bit different. So what we'll do at the start of the course is when we read something, we're going to spend some time up front looking at who is putting this together, what have they accomplished, what do they really know, and are they really the best source to deliver this message for us. So here's some practice. I want you to pause for a second and look at these situations up here and look back at your notes in the lecture that I've um, narrated so far and kind of figure out these different um, levels of credibility. And I want you to bring this with you to class, so jot something down so that I can pull this up in class for us to talk about. So pause here to complete that. First is ethos, but then secondly is pathos. Pathos is the quality of persuasion that appeals to emotions. So ethos is looking at one's character or credibility, and pathos is emotions. Lots of students get this mixed up because they try to use some kind of mnemonic memory and think ethos starts with E, as does emotion, so ethos is emotion. That will easily slip you up, um, and you really will lose lots of points if you mislabel something. So when you look at the root and origin of the word pathos, look at all these words on, on your screen. Pathology, empathy, sympathy, apathy, um, um, the word pathetic. All of these words are dealing with emotions. Um, and from the ancient Greek terms, from looking at, at suffering and experience. Um, looking at 
to continue with Pathos, it, it's a very successful tool when used appropriately. It can allow audiences to feel the pain of what the speaker is trying to say. And it's not necessarily just trying to get them to feel pain, but to really root with them on an emotional front. Emotion can be the strongest tool that you use um, when writing or speaking successfully. It ties that person in, makes them feel like they're shared in that experience, and it can help you really make logical claims stronger. When you, and we'll get to logos in just a minute. But photos and advertisements use this so much um, with humor, with, um, with some kind of sadness. If you think of the ASPCA commercials where it's the impounded animals that have been abused with the very somber music in the background, that is very great, a very good example of pathos and action and how it really just either makes you want to pick up the phone and adopt the animal or make you turn the channel because you're so emotionally disturbed by it. However, if you use emotional appeals incorrectly without some rooted foundation, it's disaster. You don't want to make an audience angry without having some kind of logic there because then once you start playing with somebody's emotions, you have to guide that ship. But if it guides itself because there's no logic there, it's going to sink. And just as like having high ethos can make an audience more likely to be persuaded, the same can be applied with pathos when used properly. They'll be more likely to understand your perspective because you've made them feel like they're shared in the experience. They're more likely to accept the claims being made and more likely to act or do some kind of call of action at the end of your speech or your writing 